Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 1, <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of G James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came onto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed, clothed in a, a, a long white garment. And they were are frightened, and he said unto them, Be not afraid, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Go, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Teach us your word. As your word is taught. All around the world, wherever this message is being listened to or will be heard, let Christ be revealed. Amen. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of truth. Reveal the truth of God's word to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. The, the resurrection is a fact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a fact. The death of Jesus is a fact. It will be an intellectual suicide to purport that Jesus did not live. On what grounds will anyone with intelligence and ability to look into facts or do a research. On what ground would, grounds would anybody be able to say that Jesus did not live physical life and still remain intelligent or intellectual? In, in the field of academia or intelligence, the existence of Jesus is, un, un, is unimpeachable, undeniable. His historicity is undeniable. The historians of those days, they didn't have to be religious people. I'm talking about Jewish, Jewish historians who really didn't believe that Jesus, or secular historians, that Jesus possibly was a Messiah. Greek believers and Roman, sorry, Greek historians and Roman scholars, they all they all recorded the life of Jesus. So to say he didn't live, I think it's a big mistake. And the life of Jesus, how it ended, is also re historically recorded. You can close the Bible and find that information somewhere else in history. So it's not uh, like the Bible said it, so he died. No, you let's assume the Bible hasn't said it. Let's assume somebody doesn't know, want to know anything about the Bible and doesn't want to know about the Bible, but is interested in uh, his, uh, history at the, within, within the Paris, Palestine territory in the times of Jesus. You come across this, which is a fact. It, and it was a major public fact, like 
9-11 cannot be denied. Those of us who were alive around that time, it was the biggest news. 9-11 cannot... Or for somebody to one day say there was never a president in America called Trump. No, you, you must wait for thousands of years to be able to try and say that. Because if you say this in our times, in fact, no one will take you for it. No one. People will actually will, may want to refer you to the mental home. So now, these are things that these the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that capture the human living of Jesus. And none of them missed. John didn't talk about his birth, uh, the nativity. John didn't talk about it. But none of them miss the death. None of them. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, uh, sorry, Mark was the shortest of the Gospels. And he actually also didn't talk about the birth of Jesus. He didn't have time for that. He started from when Jesus started ministry. Do you know, he started his record of Jesus when Jesus was 30 years old. He didn't go into his early days. Because so long as he was concerned, really, as soon as we had others, we cover it. I don't have to, he didn't have too much time to cover the details. So let's go straight to the important thing. So he starts from Jesus' ministry and begin to paste it and paste it and paste it like John. All the gospel writers, they started, if for instance, the, um, the book of John talks about the life of Jesus. And the, it's like, it's all the three years of his ministry, they spoke about it. It was spread across the chapters until it started coming to the end of the chapter. And then they started focusing more on the last week of Jesus' life. And then when he got to the last week, they gave more focus on the last day of Jesus' life. And then when he came to the last day of his life, they gave more. So for instance, if three chapters or 16, let's say 20 chapters were about the life of Jesus Christ, from verse chapter 13, I'm talking about John, from chapter 13, he started talking about the last days. From chapter 12, the last week, chapter 13, he began to focus on the last day. And he spent much of the chapters on the last day of Jesus Christ, and then a lot more on his uh, arrest, the last hours of Jesus Christ, and spent more time on the, the cross. And so it looks like a, a fast train, especially Mark, like a fast train moving towards the end. When you go to the train station, a fast train is coming very fast. But when it starts getting to the station, it starts to slow down. Start to slow down because that's where I'm coming. Now, that's how the gospel writers were. They, most, some of them didn't even focus much about the, the birth. And they didn't focus about Jesus' um, 30 years of human living. Not, not much. But when he came to the, towards the death, his ministry, and then towards the death, they slowed down significantly and gave so much attention to it. Because the death of Jesus is what starts everything. And now... All those records could not be challenged by anybody who was still alive. So when Peter started preaching, actually, in Acts chapter 2, it's very interesting. Peter, the, but the people were speaking in tongues. And it was just, they were very charismatic. You know, charismatics, when they are having a service or a meeting, people outside will know that there are people there. People outside will always know there are people there, and their neighbors will be complaining about noise. It's quite, quite, quite familiar with charismatic. So when the Holy Ghost came, the Bible says that it was noise abroad. So those outside, start outside, some came close to find out what's going on, and they started passing judgments. And some of the preposterous pres- uh, uh, proposition was, or submission was that these guys are drunk. So Peter from verse 14 of Acts chapter 2 tells them that they are not drunk as you suppose because this is early hours of the morning, verse 15. Verse 16, then checks them into scripture and said, this is what was said by prophet Joel, that in the last days, verse 17, I'll pour out my flesh and my spirit upon all flesh. So from verse 17, he quoted, verse 18, continue of the, continuation of the quotation, verse 19, continuation of the quotation, verse 20, continuation of the quotation, verse 21, then he says that 
continuation of the quotation, whoever shall believe in Jesus Christ, or shall call, so whoever calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So from verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, all the five verses were quotation. He quoted from Joel chapter 2, verse 20, 28 to 32. And when he finished that, verse, verse 22, then he tells them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is interesting. He said, men and brethren, he addressed the crowd after quoting what was, they were not there when it was written. He quotes it, and he said, men and brethren, uh, uh, men and brethren, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you. You know it. He said, you know it. I'm not talking about Jesus you, you guys don't know. I'm telling you about Jesus we all know. We all have seen. We saw what had happened to him. And said, God attested Jesus Christ of Nazareth with one signs, wonders, and miracles in your midst, as you yourselves know. That's a very important phrase. As you yourself, the, the, the life of Jesus was not in a corner. Was not in, he was in the public eye. They knew it. And so the gospel writers who wrote about Jesus, if they were lying, people would have picked them up. The book, most of those books wouldn't even survive uh, uh, um, two years. Because people were there, what are you talking about? They know it's, it's wrong. And when Jesus resurrected from the dead on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, from verse 13, but Jesus joined them, I think around verse 24, or not 24, 20, 21, 22, 23. He joins them, and he said, you know the question he asked them? He said, verse 23, actually, I think so. He said, what are you guys talking about? Uh, I think, no, let's go, let's go back. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's the verse 17 I'm actually looking for. He said, what kind of conversation is it that you... You have with one another as you walk and, and, these are disciples. They were very sad. They said, what kind of conversation are you guys having? And did you know their response? They didn't know it was Jesus. The Bible says their eyes were withheld from knowing him. They said, then one of them, <laughs> one of them was uh, Cleopas, answered and said, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? Who will living in Jerusalem in these times and wouldn't know what's going on? You're asking us what we are talking about. That is the trending news. It was trending. The, the death of Jesus was not in a corner. It was trending. So they, they didn't even know he was, who he was. He said, but are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days, it, it, it's obvious. Have you not known? He said, okay. Then told him that how there was a man. <laughs> he said, then he said, what, he said, what things? You should know that. He said, what things? Now, and he said that, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in this and was before God and all the people. Now, this is not in the corner. They said, this guy, what was happening? Uh, we are surprised you don't know this. But about Jesus Christ, he was mighty indeed and was a prophet, mighty indeed and was before God and all the people. They said, really? He said, tell us more. Tell me more. You guys tell me more. And he said, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. His crucifixion was no secret. You, you can't say I'm writing anything, or you can't talk about the history of the human living of Jesus and leave out the crucifixion. It is just a normal fact. It's, it's just basic. It's a basic, reliable fact. That's what I'm trying to say. The life of Jesus, which culminated in his death, was a basic knowledge. Basic knowledge. So it. Those who say he didn't die, they didn't live there. People, eyewitnesses were telling us this guy was crucified. You two, you managed to write other books or religious books and say Jesus didn't die. What, what, what planet are you coming from? You can't, you can't, there's no way you can convince me 
that our beloved late queen mother is not dead. Her queen is not dead. You, you can, how can you convince us? We are aware. We know. We were all part of the funeral. Some of us managed to stand by the roadside. We saw the, 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 the We saw. We saw. <laughs> so, so. And it was broadcast all around the world, the funeral. It's the same. Jesus' death, in fact, where they crucified him, they crucified him on Golgotha. And Pastor Charles has been there before. Right? Yeah, he has been there. The place is on the outside of the city, on the mountain. You can't miss it. Traders will see it. So journalists will see it. City guys will see it. Everybody saw. So what I'm saying is that the, the, the death of Christ is just a fact. I'm not, it's historic. Not, let's, let's even take religion out of it. Histor, it's a historical fact. It's a historical fact. So you are actually committing intellectual suicide by denying it. It's a, it's a historical fact. Now, so when it, came, when it comes to the death of Jesus, it's so obvious and it was so open, nobody could deny it. But then, there's something interesting about the preaching of the early church. For, and for that matter, what should be our preaching? They, they, preach, they preached the resurrection. The resurrection was foundational or is foundational and fundamental knowledge in Christianity. You are not a Christian if you didn't know or you don't know that Christ resurrected. Can I say that again? I'm not saying that you don't believe in church or things. I'm saying you are not a Christian. You are not a Christian if you, did not, if you don't know that Christ resurrected. In other words, if you don't know that the tomb is empty, you are not a Christian. Because the weight of Christian belief is, is resting on the resurrection. So, in, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible actually says that there are things that are fund, foundational, fundamental, that are elementary. It says that the dog, okay, if you start from verse 1, it makes sense. So that, therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary, fundamental, eleme, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. You can't be a Christian if you have not come to the fact that repent, you have repented from your sins. You are not a Christian if you have not repented. Just let me, let me just say that as well. You are not a Christian. Oh, no. I am. It's just you are wishing. It's like I'm wearing jersey. Manchester United and I'm telling you I'm a, a professional footballer. No, no, it's just... It, it, I might, I might manage to convince myself, but the real fact is I am not. I am not. So that's what I'm telling you. You are not a footballer because you are wearing a jersey. <laughs> so, he says that repentance from dead works. Let's all say repentance from dead works. Number two, he says that a, a faith towards God. Let's say faith towards God. How can you say, me, I don't believe in God, but I'm a Christian. <laughs> is it not laughable? <laughs> it's like, it's kind of absurd. All right. So it's just, it's just fundamental. So no one can say he's a Christian and say, I don't believe in God. How can an atheist call himself a Christian? <laughs> you, you can't be an atheist and a Christian at the same time. You can't. So, and I'm drawing your attention to something. So, believing in God is fundamental in Christianity. Faith, uh, turning from your sins, repentance from dead works is fundamental in Christianity. Now, let's see the next fundamental thing in Christianity. The doctrines of baptism. 
which reflect that we identify with the death of Christ is fundamental in Christianity. And then laying on of hands is fundamental in Christianity. Then he says the resurrection of the dead is fundamental. Now, but that's, watch this. I want to draw your attention to something. In our times, when you are a Christian, and some of us, to be honest, grew up in a Christianized environment, so resurrection of the dead and the resurrection of Christ seems to be the, a normal thing to think about. But it was very foreign in the days of Peter, John, and in the days of Jesus. It was a very, in the days of Paul, it was so foreign, particularly to the, the Gentiles. It wasn't normal. For, the scientists of the day, the students of Plato, the students of Aristotle, the intellectuals of the day, you can't be intellectual and expect that resurrection. It's, it's like madness. So resurrection in those days was because they don't expect that anyone should resurrect. To the extent that in Acts chapter 23 verse 8 says that the Sadducees, they were religious leaders in the Jewish times. They were leaders. For the Sadducees said there is no resurrection. They said there's no resurrection. So how can you now, the foundation of your preaching is resurrection. So and then when you look at, <laughs> this is nice, Acts chapter 26, verse 8, Paul was reasoning, and part of his reasoning, his case, he said, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? That means that people were thinking, why can you talk about resurrection of the dead? In Acts chapter 23, verse 6, he said something very important. That but, Paul, uh, but when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, son of the Pharisee, concerning the hope of and the resurrection of the dead and be judged. He said, this is, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Paul's preaching was resting on the resurrection. In Acts chapter 17, verse 2. Acts chapter 17, verse 3. Acts chapter 17, verse 18. And Acts chapter 17, verse 32. Acts chapter 17, verse 2, it says that, verse 2, it says that, then Paul, as his custom was, let's all say as his custom was, went into them and for Three Sabbaths, it was three weeks. Three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. That's where every good preaching starts. That's why the, as I grow, I realize that before I preach, let me read the Bible before I even pray and preach. Because every preaching starts from the scriptures. Every good preaching, sorry. Every good preaching is supposed to start from the scripture, open the scripture, explain the scripture, and make sure it's in line with what scripture says. So Paul went to them and, oh, I like this. It wasn't a gratuitous supposition. It was reasoning, factual. He reasoned. See, sometimes when you come to church, it's important for us preachers to make you feel like you are thinking. And not just thinking well, but thinking with scripture. Preach, good preaching is actually make people, it's supposed to make people think scripture. Pastor, is it right? Good preaching is supposed to make people think scripture. Reasoned. There's nothing wrong with reasoning, Christians. <laughs> There's nothing. Those who say Christianity is a, a faith is against science. You don't understand Christianity, that's why you say that. Faith and science are not opposite. Christianity itself is very scientific. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's based on reasoning. Yes. No feelings first. That's why preaching must have basis. Every preaching might have 
must have basis, scientific basis, must have historic basis, must have accurate facts, facts. Preaching must be based on facts. Not wishes. Not how we wish, how we wish, how we wish, how we wish. It must be based on facts. That is why, I'm about to say something important. That is why healthy preaching should not be based on what the pastor said God told him. <laughs> because that is subjective. No one can verify that. No one can authenticate or challenge that. Because when I come to you and say, last night I was praying and God told me, I should say this, I should say that, I should say that. It might be good, it might be genuine, it might be okay, but that shouldn't be the basis of preaching. Basis of preaching must open the scripture and reason with us based on what the scripture is saying so we can all think for ourselves. But the preacher is supposed to guide us in what the scripture is saying because the Ethiopian Union is in Acts chapter 8 verse 30. He said, how can I understand except someone explains it? So the preacher's job is to do the explanation of what is written. Pastor, start explaining the text and stop telling us about how an angel appeared to you in a cave. <laughs> it's good. Share your testimony. We love it. You went to heaven. You went to heaven. And you saw things. And you saw, it's good. It's good. Wow. Wow. That's a, I, I wish we could all get that, have that experience. Who wouldn't want such a, a wonderful, wonderful experience? It's good. But when you are behind the pulpit, in, you can say that, but make sure your main point is resting on explaining the text. Reason with us. 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 The preaching of the resurrection was not emotive. It wasn't gratuitous. Let's grant that. No, maybe you never know. Please, stop that when you are preaching. No, it's just not maybe. This is what he said. And they were preaching a resurrection that was a fact. They were preaching an empty tomb which they saw. It, was, it wasn't like, the, in fact, in Acts chapter 10, verse 41, Peter said, we, we ate with him after he, he, was, he rose. We ate with him. And to other people, to, and then it was revealed to even us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I mean, this is facts. It's, it's telling you. No wonder in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says that we have not believed fables. We are telling you, we are, we are telling you eyewitnesses account. Oh, I feel like preaching. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Hallelujah! These are not people who had a dream. It's not people who had a dream and they are saying, an angel told me something. An angel told me something. An angel. It's okay because Peter went to Cornelius' house based on encounters. So I'm not really on encounters. But good preaching is not based on whimsical, subjective encounters. So there, are major, there are some religions and cults that were birthed by the leaders personal subjective encounters and it's, it's causing much, it causes a lot of problems it causes a lot so don't 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 stay in a religious organization whether it's, a, it's, it's Christian or unchristian or any organization which is built around a, someone's personal encounters even though it can show you things that make you wow wow it can wow you with a lot of other things please Let's think. I mean, that's what I'm trying. Like, like, you know, okay. So what this what this, this, sometimes when I'm listening to preach, I'm wondering, okay, so um yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think it's so sometimes when I'm preaching, I have to be careful and be, be careful how I'm talking because sometimes intelligent people are wondering, uh, so what's the point? What yeah, yeah, yeah. So so what, what's the point now? What I tried, just, just, 
<laughs> anyway, let me go back to the text that um, Peter was talking, or Paul, they, he, 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 he went to the synagogue and for three weeks, not one hour, not one hour. In Acts chapter 19, I think verse 7 and 8, the Bible says he reduced the disciples. He reduced the disciples and went to school of Tyrannus, reasoning with them daily. Reasoning. Oh, how to be nice for us to come to church and discipleship is based on reasoning. Reasoning based, reasoning based on spiritualia, spiritualite, examinatu. Based on genuine hearts that are warm towards God, open towards God. And reasoning. Paul was reasoning with them daily in the school of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years, everyday reasoning. That's why you can't really be a pastor and pastor effectively if you are not studying. Because if you are not studying, how can you reason much? You'll be able to say, okay, I have a few things for a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why it's very challenging to pastor one church for a long time. Because very soon all your preaching will finish. <laughs> all your jokes and your stories. You know, I used to tell a lot of stories and uh, uh, like uh, funny jokes. But I've, if I tell one now, you know I've, I've heard this before. <laughs> As for a guest minister, it's easy. The people have not heard it, so that's, that's why I go. But pastoring, well, that's why you must learn how to appreciate a pastor. Never think a pastor's job is small. Especially those who labor in doctrine and word. They must be worthy of double honor. Excuse me. Excuse me. Carnal, carnal thinking. So, it says that, please, let's go back to So, he reasoned with them, chapter Acts chapter 17, Verse 2, I'm pre still preaching on resurrection. I'm preaching on the empty tomb. Then Paul, as his custom was, reasoning from the scriptures. I, I, Pastor, what I like most about this is that from the scriptures. From the scriptures. Not from the newspapers. From the scriptures. Enough of the stories about uh, Ukraine. Enough of the stories about the climate change. Enough of, <laughs> enough of the story about social justice. Enough of it. I'm not saying it's bad. But please, can we go back and reason from scripture? That's why we are in church. All the others, we can reason outside of church. But you don't go, log on the, you know, the sky, the newspaper review, and then they are discussing scripture. I know they won't do that. So <laughs> when we come to church, let's do scripture review. And then let's say later, he said, very Hallelujah. All right. Well, I just got distracted by this reasoning. So he reasoned with them for uh, uh, th th three times. Look at verse, verse three. Verse three says that explaining ah, and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ that was supposed to suffer and rise again from the dead. So you can imagine this preaching, all this reasoning, show them in scripture that, no, 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 let's get to the Christ. The Christ, some of the major clear scriptural definitions and the characteristics of the Christ is that he had to suffer. And after suffering, he has to die. And after dying, he has to rise on the third day. It's clear in scripture, but they never saw it that, that way. So he reasoned, you can tell, his reasoning was hinged on the resurrection. And then he comes to the uh, 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 Are uh, Areopagus, Mass Hill. And he went to the synagogue, actually, and then he was discussing matters. Look at verse 18. And the, the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers encountered him. They met this guy, they met, met, met. and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be, uh, to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to, oh, because he preached to them, Jesus, Makadavashaya. <laughs> they said, what, what is this guy preaching? They said, this guy is, is, is that, who is this guy? What is this babbler? 
What does he want to say? Others said that he seemed to be a proclaimer of a foreign god. Why? Because he was proclaiming, he was preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, these are philosophers. Students of Plato. Stoics, philosophers, and Epicureans. These guys were top. You can't compare them, or you, they can't compare modern day uh, lecturers in Yale and Harvard and up to them. These guys were strong. But they said, what's this guy talking about? So they said, we would like to hear him again. And then later on, when they came at Mars Hill, Paul preached Christ powerfully. And on the verse 30, he says that in the days of ignorance, God winked. God overlooked. Oh, that's what I was preaching. That God overlooked some things. Listen, God can overlook things. God can overlook. Tell someone, God can overlook things. But don't think you'll you get away with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. God can overlook and he does overlook. That's why he overlooked your stepmother's behavior for many years. He overlooked it. The more treatment, he overlooked it. Jimmy Savile. He over- <laughs> it's like God. I explained why he overlooked last, last Friday's message. So God, but it says that in the times of ignorance, God winked or God overlooked. But now, command all men everywhere to repent. Don't say, oh, next week I'll do it. Say, now. He's overlooked it enough. But now, now that you are hearing this now, don't say, don't wait and say after church, you have, you have a plan. So maybe next, the end of this year, everything. Please, it might be too late. Because he says, but now, repent. He commands all men. Everywhere, all men, including men in UK, all men everywhere, including men in New York, all men, including men in China, men there means human beings, all people everywhere to repent. Rep- I think, please help me. Why don't we pre- tell someone, repent, repent, repent? I know some of us can't say it. All right, let's get to the text. So, in the verse. In verse 32, just cut, look at verse 32. Look at verse, very interesting. Verse 32, see, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they mocked, while others said, we will hear you again, this resurrection of the dead. They said, what is this? What, what is this? this game? No wonder they thought he was a babbler. <laughs> when they heard, they were listening to him happily. He was making a good case. He was making a good case. Oh, yeah. Until he brought resurrection. Oh, excuse me. Excuse, drop this one. I think let's leave this guy alone because there's something wrong with him. <laughs> when they had, and look, look at this. This is what I'm trying to say. That the early church, the resur- to talk about resurrection, is not normal. It's not normal. You'll be very isolated in society. Intellectually isolated. They'll frown on you. And then in those days, uh, it's only the Pharisees who really believed in it. And general Jewish community, community believed one day there will be a resurrection. So they had, but generally speaking, everywhere, resurrection was not like a, a, a popular thing to go with. And now these people, the basis of their preaching was a resurrection. Why would you do that? To the extent that Jewish boys who were taught from the Torah, it's like, uh, taught from the Torah to worship God on Saturdays. Check it. They went to the synagogue on Sabbath. It's the Sabbath thing. You can't change it because it's just like telling a Muslim to change worshiping your God from Friday and facing Mecca. You can't face anywhere. No, you can't tell a Muslim that. A, a, no Muslim will change that. Because Friday is the dandy. In the same way, Jewish boys will know. And for these guys who are living in Jewish community, beginning to change their day of worship to first day of the week, to Sunday. Why would they do that? Because that was the day of the resurrection. Because their message was the resurrection. It's alive. It's alive. You risk, you risk being 
punished. You risk being hated by the society, the Jewish society. But they couldn't help because what they had seen, they couldn't deny it. They, they saw the empty tomb. Now, when there's the text we heard in Luke chapter um, 24 from verse 1, Bible talks about how, this, this is a very interesting story. Early in the morning, Mark chapter 16 says, very early in the morning, the women, they went to the tomb. That's after the Sabbath, because Sabbath you are not supposed to go. So after the Sabbath, they went to the tomb. What were they going to do? They went with spices. Please, it is not cologne or body wash or aftershave. But why did you say it's not aftershave, cologne, body wash or perfume? Because cologne, aftershave, and body wash is for the living. <laughs> they were not going to expect a living person there to go and use cologne on him. They went with spices to go and embalm the dead body. So they were not expecting the resurrection of Jesus. That's what I'm trying to say. They didn't expect it. They went to the tomb to go and make sure the body is resting in peace and happy. They went, it's like, you have a loved one, like I lost my twin sister a few years ago, and I go to the tomb side to go and lay a wreath on the tomb, and then when I go, the tomb is, is empty. Hey, where is she? <laughs> no. Hey. So I, I, I'll start asking people, uh, have you seen th those who are in charge of the, uh, the graveyard? Or, I, I, have you seen anybody here? Who has taken, I won't even ask, do you see her? No, ask, who has, have you seen her body? Some people seem to have come to assume the body. I don't know. Maybe they are using it for ritual. Or maybe, maybe, maybe they, 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 where, where, where is my sister's body? Where, where, where is some of you who have, who have maybe your grandfather or your father or mother or something? You go and it's not there. You'll be concerned. Where, where is the body? You are not looking for your grandma, but you are looking for her body. You are not looking for your grandfather. You are looking for her body. They went to go and embalm him. Only three days after this guy has died. They went to go and perform an expression of love on the dead body. So they went to the tomb looking for a dead body. Come on. They were looking for a dead body. That's why they went. Because if you are not looking for a dead body, you won't go to the tomb. You might go to the hospital. When you go to the hospital, you are not going to look for a dead body. When they tell you that somebody has passed and they, 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 they took him to the bypass, you don't go to the hospital. You go to the mortuary, or you have to trace where is the nearest mortuary. Where did they take? Because you don't look for a dead body where human being, where living is. But they went to the 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 the, the, the graveyard, the center for dead people, to go and look for the dead because they are looking for a dead man. They are looking for a dead man. They were looking for a dead man. Please get it. They were looking for a dead man. No wonder when he met them, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Emmaus verse 17, he says, that, why are you sad? They were sad because to them, they knew that it's game over. Oh, disciples knew it was game over. They put all their hopes. Some left their trade. Others left their jobs. And some like you left their boyfriends. Others left their girlfriends. Oh, I'm telling you, some, some left their gangs. Some say, you know what I'm talking about. They left their gang, their gang just to come to church and follow Jesus. Only to realize that this thing was leading to a dead end. Cool de sac. They didn't know. They thought, they, they thought this is not a cool de sac. It's just a tunnel to the other side. Only to go and go and realize that, oh no, he's dead. All hopes dashed. That's what happened when you read Luke chapter um, um, 24, verse 17, 18, 19. That's why they were sad. They said, he, don't you know about him? He's a prophet. God raised him. He's a prophet among the people concerning Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in this and where. He said, this, this, we, we, we believed him. We followed him. And he just came to a grinding halt. I'm sad. We are sad. And they said, but what was interesting is 
Some of our women went to the tomb to go and embalm him. And then when they went, he was not there. They said he wasn't there. He was just not there. And what the, the account we read in Mark, when they were going, they had a problem. It's the women, and there was a big stone they've used to cover the tomb. And they started thinking ahead, who will roll away the stone? Because the stone was big. But when they got there, the stone had rolled away. It wasn't rolled away so Jesus could come out. It was rolled away so we can see the empty tomb. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Because it wasn't, Jesus could pass through locked doors and just appear. So it wasn't a stone at the tomb that can stop him. It was rolled away. And they went in and they saw some young man in a white, long garment. White. I was even thinking about that. White and long garment. And maybe there's something in it. Maybe I should change it. <laughs> White, long garment. And they saw, and they, and they, when you read the Luke's account, Luke chapter 24, and the verse 4 and 5. Luke 24, verse 4 and 5. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, they beheld two men, uh, so, uh, sorry, two men, uh, uh, behold, two men by, stood by them in a shining garment. I don't know what kind of shining, it's just like some of the ladies <laughs> dress. They stood by them. And I look at, the, look at the discourse that went on. And then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living? Hallelujah. Wrong address. Wrong address. Hallelujah. Wrong address. When they tell you Jesus died and that's it. No, wrong address. When he died, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. His death was not the end. His death was, in, in, in fact, his death was the beginning. His death was not the end. It's the angel said, why, that's a very serious scripture. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? You don't go to Nando's to go and look for Banku. <laughs> no. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? You, you can't go to some restaurant, sushi, restaurant, and then expect Amala and uh, Edikaiko or something like that. Is it Edikaiko? Edikaiko. <laughs> no, you can't. They don't have cow food there. <laughs> So, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? They went among the dead looking for the living. Our Jesus is alive. Somebody say he's alive. He's alive. Shout he's alive. he's alive. And the verse 6 says that, verse 6 says that he is not, <laughs> he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. He's risen. And now he said, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. He told them he'll be alive. In Mark chapter 8 verse 31, Mark chapter 9 verse 31, Mark chapter 10 verse 34, he told them I'll be alive. Remember how he told you. You forgot him because of the death. Sometimes when you go through some things, you might forget about some other important things. You might, the way you are so upset with your mom you don't want to talk to her again. Don't forget the sacrifice here. You told one day, you said, Mom, you've been so good to me. I won't forget. Now you are so upset. Yeah, I can understand you're upset. Being a self is justifiable. But don't let that make you forget. Do not forget. Do not, I've met people who say, Pastor, you've changed my life. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, you've changed my life. 
until you tell them, no, this guy you are going out with, it will, help, it, it will hurt your future. It will help your future. And the guy said, you know, those pastors said, the pastor himself, maybe he likes you. Let, let's, go to, let's go to another church. <laughs> you forgot the, the one, those who taught you your early Christian knowledge. They taught you, they helped you to stand in God. And they are telling you that this path is not good. You are not making it a social issue. So it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget that your children's future is on the line. It's easy to forget that your attitude towards church might have eternal consequences. It's easy to forget because at the moment you are so upset with your wife you, need, you want to divorce. So that's all that you think about. And because of that, and the church you are in will not encourage divorce, so you choose, I'm leaving. It doesn't matter. I'm going back to the church my mother used to attend. It's Aladura. I'm going there. <laughs> Every, now, now, now your philosophy has changed. Every church is church. <laughs> oh, is it? They are not preaching from the Quran. They are all using the Bible. Every church is church. I don't have to travel that far. Every church is church. Oh. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Mom, this your boy who joined the gang and has evidence of tap wounds, wounds on his leg, on his thighs. He used to be your biggest friend. Oh, God, my son. Now he's on the street doing outreach. And you are beginning to curse the church that he's going now. You were happy when he left the gang. The church that pulled him out of the gang is showing him the way forward. He said, no, no, you can't go too far like that. Just, just stay at the edges. You can't go too far. And now he said, no, every church is church. You don't have to go all that way far. Just stay. You see, BBC has been saying something about those black churches. You don't have to go. Just stay here. <laughs> you... You forget very quickly. You forget very quickly that when you, are in cri- you were in crisis, the way you were believing God for this anointing to work for you. Now you are crisis free. <laughs> they forgot all the things that Jesus told them. When the crisis of the cross hit, they forgot. Peter said, I don't know this guy. I don't know him. I don't know him. Peter said, I don't know. So in Mark, he says that go and tell the disciples and Peter, because at that time he has become a separatist. <laughs> he, said, he said, go tell his disciples and Peter. <laughs> Peter has said, the one who said, I will die with you. I would die with you if everybody forsake you. Me, I would die with you. He has left to the fact that they have to say disciples and Peter. I do. <laughs> Crisis! That's why when you are making promises, I think you have to be economical. <laughs> and think very far, especially romantic ones. I know I'm talking to somebody. I know I'm reminding somebody of what has happened recently. Can, can, can I go off a little bit? I, have, oh, I don't have time. I was teaching some young people recently, and I was telling them that, see, when you're a guy, you're going out with a woman, and suddenly, or even you're married, Okay, but generally, yeah. Marriage, you can't do much. So the ones you are going. <laughs> and when your woman goes quiet and changes her demeanor for you to know she's troubled, she's waiting for you to ask, is everything okay? And when you ask her and she said, I'm fine, I think don't go far. <laughs> because manipulation is about to follow. <laughs> if 
if you are fine, why have you changed your countenance? So when he says, I'm fine, it's another way of tormenting your conscience. To keep probing and pushing and start making promises. Don't worry. I'm here for you. Don't worry. Whatever you say, I'm telling you. I'll act for you. Please talk to me. Don't be afraid. Tell me. I am your man. Listen. I've pro- hey, boy, boy. Take your time. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. When she goes quiet and says, I'm fine. She may want to tell you that stop your mother from calling you. <laughs> She's about to tell you, I don't think we should go to that church. So stop making the promise. Please talk to me. I'm there for you. No, don't. When she goes quiet for a while and she tells you I'm fine, and you ask, but you don't look fine. So no, I'm fine. It's okay. You don't look. It's controlling. It's controlling. It's just, and the children, the children, even young girls. I ask my daughter, Are you okay? I'm fine. Hey, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. No, no. come on. What do you mean by you are fine? <laughs> I feel like preaching, you know. All right, let's go back to the text then. <laughs> you see, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go off. I don't got time. And now, what? What was the point I was even making? <laughs> yeah, go tell uh, my and uh, Tita and the disciples, because when the crisis hit, they forgot. When the crisis is, Peter forgot his promises. And not only his promises, and he forgot Jesus' promises. When the crisis, so they went to the tomb going to look for a dead person. He said, remember what he told you while he was with you in Galilee. Remember. Remember the preaching you heard in, on your wedding day. Pastor, where did they preach here? Does it work? It only works for the congregation. The other people were there. <laughs> because the bride and the groom is likely, not always, it's likely because I'm sure when I preach at your wedding, you remember. <laughs> I'll have to make sure you remember. <laughs> Sometimes I will, I'm thinking of, you know, we have to put in systems to make people remember. You jump and then sit, pull the groom from the chair and sit there or the bride and then sit. That one, they will forget that. <laughs> but they may still forget the message. <laughs> but he said, remember what he told you. Remember his promises. And so you can tell. Then he, all the disciples were afraid. They were hit. So he came, she, the women came and told the disciples, that we went to the tomb. It's empty. In John, John's account, John chapter 20, the Bible said Peter got up and he started making his way to the tomb from verse 3 to 8. And then the other disciple, who is supposed to be John, he also got up, but John was younger. So John could run faster than Pastor, I mean, Sir Robert. So John went, <laughs> John overtook uh, Pastor Peter. But when he got there, he couldn't go in. He had to wait for Pastor Peter to come. He stood outside and looked. And they saw the, the uh, linen, the Israel, fold, nicely folded. Nicely folded. They saw the linen cloth lying there. Yet, they did, he didn't go in. And then when Peter came, they went in. They saw, but you know what? They didn't see the body. So it could be argued that it was stolen. The point is, they didn't see the body. Even in Mark, the angel said, he's not here, he's risen. Go. So then, someone will say that, really, they didn't see him, just the body was not there. But the truth is, they didn't need to see the, the rising Jesus. He rose, he rose and he wasn't staying in the tomb. Because, why are you looking for the living? What they needed from the tomb was that it's empty. Then they went and regarded and then on the first day of the week, they were there, and Jesus appears, John chapter 20. He appears in the room from verse 18, and he said, peace I give you, my peace I live with you. They were afraid because they were all afraid. They had locked their door, hiding behind, and they, listen, this is the point I'm trying to raise, that the disciples never expected the resurrection. 
The disciples never expected. The women who went there, they didn't go with aftershave. They went with embalming for dead body. So, and it, so it wasn't usable for him because it's not a dead body. They didn't expect. Therefore, when they saw him, they were not sure. In fact, in Luke chapter 24, after he had the experience with those who were on the road to Emmaus, Bible says that, listen to me, brothers and sisters, he then began to explain from the Bible, from the scriptures, all that concerns the Messiah and his resurrection. He explains the resurrection from them. And Bible says, they said, when he was doing, did our hearts not burn in us? And then when they arrived, he said, bring food. They, they, he broke the bread and he vanished. Then in verse 39, he, they went and told the disciples. Then Jesus himself comes there in the verse 39. And he, he comes there and they said, they thought it was a ghost. He said, look, look at my hands. I'm not a ghost. Look, it's real. I'm here. And he says something very interesting. He said, do you have food? Do you have fish? Bring it. Let's eat. Yeah. Because ghosts will not eat. So he said, while he's still, while, listen, listen, look at, look at the test. He says that, but while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? And they said, yes, we got fish. So they brought the fish, the uh, 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 broiled one, good one, and some honeycomb. They brought it, and watch this, he ate with them. He took it and ate it in their presence. It's, it's, it's not a ghost, it's a real, real human being. Now watch, this is the, the point here. Why would they go and say he's not alive? Kill them for it. Kill them for it, because this is too personal an experience to take it away from them. So everywhere they went, they preached the resurrection. The resurrection is just so fundamental. Let me just give you quick points why the empty tomb is necessary. The empty tomb, the tomb is empty. It proves the resurrection. And the resurrection is the foundation of Christian doctrine. It's foundational of Christian doctrine. Because the fact that Jesus resurrected, one, it points to the fact that God the creator is still working amongst men. Because it was God who raised him from the dead. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, whom ye, verse 23, whom ye through lawless hands delivered him and killed. You crucified and put to death. Verse 24, but God raised him. Let's we all say that together. Let's say that again. Or please say it louder. So God raised Jesus from the dead. God raised him. In Acts 6, 26, 8, it says that, why do you consider it incredible that God should raise the dead? So now, one, the resurrection, the empty tomb points to the fact that God, the creator, is still working amongst men. Very important. And number two, it validated Jesus Christ, or it validated who he was. He said he was the son of God. It's true. He was the son of God. It's true. What he said. Now, he said to them on a few occasions that he, will, he, will, he was going to death and he will rise again. He said, I will rise again. I will rise again. I will rise again. He validated who Jesus was. The fact that he said he's the son of God meant he's the son of God. The fact that he's the, he said, I am the resurrection and the life meant he really was. Because how can you kill life? Think about it. How can you kill life and keep life dead? You can't kill life. So he's there. And how can resurrection stay in grave? No, he's the resurrection. John chapter 11, verse 25. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. So then, the, it's, it's, it's validated who Jesus was. Listen, that is why other religions cannot no religion, even if they claim Jesus lived and they claim they are familiar with Jesus, they cannot endorse the resurrection. Because the biggest problem of those other calls and religion is that Jesus is not God. Their problem is Jesus, you say Jesus is God, he's not God. But if he resurrected, then he's God. So that's why to, to, Jehovah's Witness can't say Jesus is the son of God. 
Islam will tell you, Jesus is in the Quran. I'm wondering what he's doing there. Jesus is in the Quran. <laughs> Can I advise you? Can I advise you? It's a fake Jesus in it. It's a fake. Je- the one in the Quran is not the Jesus the Bible is talking about. It's a fake. This is a dummy one. Oh, why are you saying this? Is he the son of God? No. Did he die? No. Quran will say he didn't die. One of the disciples, God did a miracle and swapped him. No, 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 please. That's, it didn't I tell you. It's a fake one. The fake one has to swap because he was afraid to die. <laughs> He's afraid to die. But the original one, he said, kill me. I'm here. Kill me. He came to die. In fact, one of his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, 24, called Peter. He told him, you can't die. After he told them he's going to die in Jerusalem, and on third, on the, he didn't hear that. He didn't hear that on third day. The disciple didn't hear on the third day. He began to show them how he has to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raise up on the third day. He didn't hear that. One of his close allies, 22, Peter took him on the side. Peter took him on the side and started rebuking him. He said, God forbid, far be for it. Lord, it shall never happen to you. It should never. No, you can't talk about that. Peter tried to stop the death. But Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. If you, if you listen to last Friday's message, you will understand why Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Because Jesus died on the cross for, for God. He died on the cross for God. Satan, get behind me. Now watch, watch this. He said, Satan, get behind me. So even the disciples didn't want him to die. His close allies didn't want him to die. But he said, for to this end have I come to the world. He said, I laid my life down. John chapter 10, verse 18. I laid down and I picked it up. He came to face the cross. He was never afraid to go to the cross. He wanted to go to the cross because that's why he came. So why would you say that that same Jesus swapped with somebody? For what? Wouldn't that be more treatment? It's a professional more practice. That you say you came to die, we are following you. When it's time to die, you make someone die. Meanwhile, if Jesus dies, he'll resurrect. But the other guy, he can't resurrect. It's, it's not fair. It's, it's not fair. The other guy who was... The Jesus, they say, is in the Quran, is not there. It's a fake one. It's a fake one. It's a fake one. Never go to the Quran looking for Jesus. You will find him. So why would they say it's inside? So they can distract your attention to start listening to them. They, are, they want audience. It's marketing. It's just basic marketing. <laughs> it's click, click bait. Click. <laughs> you can only find Jesus here. Well, so it validates who he is. Number two or three. Number, 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 number three, very important. That means God accepted his sacrifice. God accepted. Because the Telestai, it is finished. He did a good job. It's finished. God raised him. You've done the job. On the cross, he went to, he was not just dying, he was working. On the cross, he was working. He's finished the job, job accomplished. God raised him up from the dead. So God, it means God accepted his sacrifice. Number four, quickly. <clears throat> So, it, number four, it actually authenticates Jesus' claims, he himself. Some people will tell you, in fact, the other time I was preaching in Birmingham, we went to outreach, oh, and even in Peckham, a Muslim guy came and said, show me where Jesus said he's God. He said in several places, he's God. And it authenticates the claim that he's God. Because you can't, how can you kill God? Can anyone kill God? You can't kill God. You can kill the human Jesus, but because he's God, you come back. So it authenticates his claims. He said, I will die and I will resurrect. Uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Mark chapter 10, verse 34. And quickly, number five, it, it validates the Old Testament. Because you know, Paul went to reason with them concerning the suffering of Christ. From the Old Testament. The prophets in the Old Testament have said it. When Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, he said, David being a prophet, Spoke verse 32, Acts chapter 2, from verse 31, 32. David being a prophet, he spoke concerning the resurrection. Being a prophet and knowing that God has promised him with an oath that he will raise the Christ from the fruit of his body 
according to the flesh, he, uh, he will raise the Christ to sit on his throne. He spoke concerning the resurrection. So David spoke concerning the resurrection. The prophets of old spoke concerning. So what does that mean? In fact, Acts chapter 24 verse 14, he says that uh, Paul was defending himself and he said, I confess that according to the way in which you cause the sect, so worship I the God of our fathers, believing all things which were written in the law and the prophets. So the resurrection was validating the prophets, the words of the prophets and the Old Testament. Old Testament is actually a word of God. Jesus came, he said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophet, but I came to fulfill it. So he fulfilled it to show that this thing is from God. The Old Testament is from God. So the prophets validate their prophets. And then number six, the resurrection, um, number five or six? Number six. Number six is, if Jesus resurrected, I can't go into scriptures too much because my time is number. If Jesus resurrected, that means we shall also resurrect. Yeah. It's a major statement for the resurrection of the dead. Acts, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you, you start reading, it's interesting from verse 3. He said, I commit to you what was first delivered to me. I deliver it to you. I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for our sins. Amen. Amen. That's, that's good news. Look at the next verse. He died for... and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the, the scriptures have said it already. So he rose again the third day. But when you go on, look at the verse 12. You go down to the verse 12. It says that, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, he's not saying that some among you say it's not true. Says that half are people saying that the dead, other dead bodies will not resurrect. So Christ's resurrection is a proof test that we shall resurrect. Go on to the next verse, verse 13, quickly. Verse 13 says that, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Okay, so if Christ, but if Christ is risen, then really there's resurrection of the dead. So in, in verse 20, it says that Christ is the first fruit. Okay, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who are, who are dead. So if we die, Christ is the first. Dead, falling asleep means dead. All right, he's the first fruit. He resurrected, so we shall also rise. Hallelujah. Amen. Grandma, who was so godly, she will rise. Amen. When the believer dies, it's good night. It's not bye bye, it's good night. Because we shall reunite again. We shall reunite again. We shall reunite again. Now this is how the, the Stoic philosophers, they be, the Greek philosophers, their belief was that the physical flesh is like prison. So they believe that when you die, it's like now liberation. They believe in the eternality of the soul, not the immortality of the flesh. So when Paul came and now was talking about resurrection of the flesh, ah, now that I've been free from this thing, you're bringing the resurrection. No, 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 no. They said, this is nonsense. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Jewish, true Jewish Christian teaching is about the resurrection of the body, not the eternal, eternality of the soul. The soul, when a believer dies, his spirit goes to the Lord or his soul goes to be with the Lord. But then during the resurrection, the, the dead body, the physical body will reunite. So he will reunite our buried bodies to our soul. So when I see you, I know it's you. When you see me, you know it's me. When we die, and okay, at what age are we going to rise? So if I die, by the time I die, I don't have hair. When I resurrect, am I going to have hair? This, this has, I've diverted a bit, but let me tell you. We will resurrect in our prime. In our freshness. So, in our, in our perfect human the way you're. So, even if someone was a child and was maybe dropped and became lame or became disabled, during, and he's a believer, dies. During the resurrection, he's going to resurrect like the perfect human body. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. Because he says that the mortality shall put on immortality. He says that our vile body, vile body, shall become like his, first, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 21, our vile bodies shall become like his glorious body. 
So it will change. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we will change. In the twinkling, we will change. We are, we, it's not going to be this same body, even, if it's this, even though it's the same being. So if Christ resurrected, we shall also resurrect. Number seven quickly and then. Number seven is so powerful. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 to 58. Verse 55 says that, oh, death, where's your sting? Wow. Oh, oh, Hades. Oh, that Hades is grave. Okay, one translation uses grave, which I prefer that one. Said, oh, Hades, oh, grave, oh, grave, where is your victory? The victory of the grace, grave has been taken from the grave. When it comes to a believer, the grave is not the end. The grave has not gained victory over you. Why? Because Christ, oh, come on. Hallelujah. Because Christ resurrected. But much more, look at the next verse. We are going to verse 58. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57. He said, but thanks, thank, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. How? Through Christ. So because of Christ's resurrection, we also have been given the victory. We have advanced settlement that when you die, you resurrect. So I don't even know why you will not be in Christ. Because that's the only guarantee. You resurrect. To be honest, to be honest everybody will resurrect. Every human being, every human being, including Osama bin Laden, Hitler, all will resurrect. But some to damnation and some to glory. So, so those of us who are in Christ will resurrect to bliss, to glory. Ha. You know, some people say, but you, do you believe in these things? Yes. Just that the way you believe your mother is, your, your mother, your mother says your father is your father. You believe that one. The way you believe, the way you believe your date of birth. You believe your date of birth. You believe it. You believe that you have small intestines and big intestines, large intestines. You believe that you have pancreas. You, you believe that your pancreas pro produces pancreatic juice. That helps, that helps to digest. You believe it. You believe it. Have you seen it before? Have you seen it working before? They yeah, are telling me I shouldn't believe in the life after death when the manual of life has told me. <laughs> so, quickly, look at this, the last verse, the verse 58. Therefore, my beloved, this is very interesting. Let's all read it from the screen. Let's go, if you can see it. church do the work of God because of the resurrection knowing that if Christ resurrected your labor will come on because of the resurrection you should do church work you should sign up to be a missionary because of the resurrection you should get involved more with God's work get involved Sac it will always call for sacrifice. Every good thing will call for sacrifice. Be willing to sacrifice to do more of God's work. My brother, be willing to start coming to church regularly and get involved and serve others for the sake of God. Because of the resurrection. Say so your labor will not, be because of the resurrection, your labor, knowing this. Therefore, when you see therefore, pause to think what that therefore is there for. He is there to tell you that therefore based on the resurrection, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Big question. Are you doing the work of the Lord? And are you, are you abounding or declining in the work of Why? For as much as you know, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Never think you are doing it for any, any group of people or a pastor or some people because, uh, because you are, when you are doing church work. No. It comes with inconvenience. Yes, of course. Just like motherhood. And good parenting comes with a lot of inconvenience. A lot of inconveniences. It comes very inconvenient, especially when you have a toddler or toddlers. But we are happy to do that, but not the work of the Lord. The resurrection says that do the work. Do the work. Do the work. Knowing that no man will fool you. You rather will fool yourself if you don't do it. Do the work and don't do it for a man. Did he say do the work of a pastor? Then he said, do the work of a church. Then he said, do the work of uh, David. He said, do the work of the Lord. Find God's work and get busy doing it because of the resurrection. It's a statement to all of us. That's why I preach the way I preach. And then finally, number eight, 
because of the resurrection, we have hope in life. doesn't matter what is happening in your life. Don't give up because Christ has resurrected. We have, it says that if Christ did not resurrect, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 14, our faith is vain. Our preaching is vain. Wow. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Our faith is also empty. Go on. We are going to verse 19. Verse 15. Yeah. And we have been found to be false witnesses because we say Christ raised Christ. We testify that Christ, God raised the Christ who he did not raise. That. The next verse. Verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. 18, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have died in, in Christ have perished. But look at the next verse, 19. If in this life alone we have hope in Christ, we are of all men. No, it's not only in this life. So we, our hope goes beyond this life. The anchor, Bible says our hope is an anchor which goes beyond the veil. Hebrews chapter 6, it goes beyond the veil. In other words, beyond humanity, beyond physical things. Our hope goes there. So you are working here by your hope. It's not just that you one day you'll be in heaven, but the source, the strength, you are being strengthened. The, the hinge of why you are doing what you are doing is not anything mundane, nothing ethereal, nothing natural. It's supernatural in nature. Because Christ resurrected. Because that's why the resurrection is important. And that's why the empty tomb is there to say it all. Did you receive something? Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. The tomb is empty. Yeah. Hallelujah! Let's give Jesus praise for the empty tomb. Let's celebrate Jesus for an empty tomb. Hallelujah! 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 Glory to Jesus. With all heads bow. With all heads bow. Let's bow our heads. I don't want to end this message without giving somebody an opportunity to take advantage of the empty tomb and let Jesus become your life. Let Jesus be your source of hope. A lot of things have happened in life. But Jesus is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There have been many changes in your life. Some nice changes, some also unexpected and bitter changes. But Jesus remains ever faithful. He is the life and the resurrection. I don't know what is dead in your life. But if he has to come back to life, then I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the resurrection. Is it your, your career? Is it your marriage? Is it your relationship? Is it your, your business? Is it your family life? Oh, Jesus is our hope. Jesus is the life and the resurrection. I don't want to end without giving somebody an opportunity to say, Pastor, please pray for me. I want Christ. I want Christ in my life in truth. And I'm ready to start a new life in Jesus. If that is your genuine desire, you say, Pastor, pray for me. On Easter Sunday, it's very historic. Easter Sunday, you are saying that, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus in my life. I, I want him to come into my life. I want a new start in Jesus. If that is your genuine desire, I would like to pray for you. So I want to see your hand. Slip up your right hand above your head. If that is your genuine desire, you want to say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need Jesus. Slip up your right hand above your head and keep it up so I can pray with you. God bless you as you do that. I want to pray with you. Slip up your right hand so we can pray. Say, Pastor, I need Jesus. I want to start. I need a fresh start. I want the resurrection to be my reality. I want it to be my reality. Lift up your right hand. It is no need to look at whether someone has done it or you, uh, you, someone hasn't done it. Just deep in your heart, you know God is talking to you. You want to do it. Slip up your right hand so we can pray. Now, if you are also watching online, I would like to pray with you. If you are watching online, I want to pray with you. And I need you to say these words after me and those here and your hands up, say this way. Let's all say this words together. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner, but I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross to save me from my sins. And you resurrected to give me new life. From today, I repent from my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. Please wash me with your blood, and make me a brand new person 
on the inside. I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. I make a commitment from today onwards. I will love you. I will obey you. I will serve you. I will be in church and I will worship you with all my heart. Thank you for doing this for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you for all those who have genuinely said this prayer. I pray that the power of the resurrection will be activated in your life. And may you receive strength to serve God and persevere to the end. For the scripture says, he who perseveres to the end, the same shall be saved. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you are watching online and you said that prayer genuinely, guess what? It's a new start. It's a new day. There, there will be an information on the screen and the announcer will give you some information. Please follow the information and the rest of you, you can follow the information and then join us later. Now, now that we are offline, those in the building, let's bow our head. If you are here, you said, you said it genuinely. 